here. So uh, today, the title of my message, uh, it's, it's a little bit hard uh, because I, I want to escape from not sharing this, but it was continually on my heart for a few days. So I know that when I want to run away from something, that God wants to me to share uh, it with you. So the title today is uh, called Overcoming Temptations. Um, God has done a, a marvelous thing in my life. You know, since coming to Christ in 2005, uh, he's helped me overcome a lot of my temptations. So my goal today is not to go into the theology because I don't think I'm capable of doing that, uh, but just to share uh, what God has taught me, but ultimately to share how Jesus overcame and to share how Jesus overcame, that we can do the same thing. So today's verse uh, that I will be sharing from is going to be from Matthew 4, verses 1 through 11. So if you have that up, let's read along. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to a holy city, and he had stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdom of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and angels came and attended to him. So, Father, we thank you for this precious word. Father, we ask, Lord, that you teach us, Lord, how to overcome temptation, how to overcome just like Jesus did, Lord. So, Father, whatever preconceived notion that we have, Lord, we just ask, Lord, that you will give us fresh revelation today, Lord. Not only fresh revelation, Lord, to just keep it in our mind, but also to in our hearts so that we can be transformed to bring you all glory, Lord. So, Father, we thank you. So we just ask that you continue to minister to us now. In Jesus' name we pray. So we, we find this passage not only in Matthew, but also in Luke and also in Mark. Uh, I invite you to further study the scripture, uh, and a great place to start is Genesis and also Deuteronomy. So in this passage, Jesus uh, had just been baptized in, in the water, and before he started his ministry, the Spirit of God descended upon him, and his Father declared him to be his beloved Son. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Sometimes uh, I, I, when I look at the word to be tempted, I always, maybe in my upbringing or not, there's always a, a negative connotation to it, like something bad or something wicked. Like I'm tempted to get angry or I'm tempted to worry or I'm tempted to steal. But in the scripture here it says, simply put, tempted to means to be tested, is to be tested. Another meaning of it is to solicit to sin. So it is in this context for evil purposes that the devil wants to do. So Satan here tempts Jesus in three different occasions. The first one is to turn stones into bread. The second one is to cast himself off the temple. And the third one is glory for the kingdom of the world. So let's look at each of these temptations. The first temptation, to turn stones into bread. In verse 3, Satan says, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. You know, Jesus has just finished fasting for 40 days. He had nothing to eat, 
He was very hungry. He was probably very weak and very tired. I tried to fast. Glad there's backups here. <laughs> I tried to fast once, and after one day, I was shivering, I was irritated, I was almost hallucinating. So here Jesus was fasting for 40 days in the wilderness all by himself. So Satan took advantage of the situation to tempt Jesus, to solicit Jesus to sin. What is the real temptation here? Was it about food? You know, to eat, it's all right. God made all things. He said it was good to eat. You know, during his ministry, Jesus fed five thousands with five loaves of bread and two fish. And on another occasion, he fed four thousand with seven loaves of bread and some fishes. So the real temptation here was uh, for Jesus to doubt God and not to trust in God. It was not about food. And sa Satan says, if you are the son of God, he repeated three times. He was casting doubt in the mind of Jesus, in the heart of Jesus. Satan knew that Jesus was the son of God. You know, in fact, when Jesus knows that he is the son of God as well, he was with the father all the time. He was born of the father, and the father brought him down here. So Jesus knows this, and Satan is trying to tempt Jesus to doubt his relationship with the Father. He's trying to wedge between the Father and the Son here. So, Jay's, so Satan chooses point of weakness to challenge Jesus by casting doubt. Doubt that God does not care for you, Jesus. God does not love you. God does not, God just led you out here to the wilderness and just abandoned you. You know, we see this temptation occurred in Genesis, right? When Eve was tempted in the garden, you know the story. God said, don't eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. But of course, Satan, as the serpent came and says, did God really say that? He put a doubt in Eve's mind, and of course, we know the story, that Eve fell and she disobeyed God. Satan here challenged Jesus to prove his divinity to meet his own needs for food by turning stones into bread and not to wait on God. Not waiting on God's will and to be disobedient. Jesus could have easily turned it into to bread, right? We've seen it. He turned water into wine later on at the beginning of his ministry. But instead, Jesus reminded Satan of a higher priority and is to obey God and to do his will. That's why Jesus responded in verse 4, that man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. I like it because Jesus uses this word alone. Because there's more to life, you know, there's more to life than food. Of course we need food to eat, but Jesus is saying otherwise. Jesus is stating that it's better to do the will of God to be obedient to his word is more important. It's more important than money, it's more important than education, it's more important than prestige. You know, things of themselves are wonderful, but they cannot take the place before God. That's what is Jesus is saying, is that we should do the same, to trust in God and not doubt him when we are tempted or tested. So the second temptation here Satan puts on is to cast himself off the temple to save himself. In verse five through six, the devil took Jesus to the top of the temple in the holy city and tempted Jesus to cast himself down because God will send angels to save him. You know, this temptation came quickly after the one in the wilderness. And I was scratching my head, what is that all about? This is just my conclusion, so I welcome you to explore it again, was that Jason, Satan thought that he was clever, really. Satan thought that he was really clever by changing the location, by taking Jesus from the wilderness and into the temple, into Jerusalem. And we all know that Jerusalem and the holy temple is where God dwells. 
in the first temptation, temptation, Satan was seeking to persuade Jesus that God is so far off. That God does not care for you. God just left you out here alone. So in the second temptation, Satan is not arguing that God is far away, but God is right here. You're in his house. So why don't you just go ahead, throw yourself down? If you're in your, uh, God's house, he's going to pick you up, wouldn't he? Wouldn't he? You're right there in the house. So what is really the temptation here? Satan tries to attempt Jesus to convince his father to save him because he was not near. The real temptation here is to manipulate God to do what Jesus wanted, to command God to do what Jesus needed. How did Jesus respond? In verse 7, Jesus said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. In other words, don't tell God what to do. Don't insist or demand God to do when you want him to do it. Jesus is saying we are not to do this because we have no authority over God. He is authority over us. We cannot force anything from God. All we can do is obey God. The third and the final temptation, the glory of the kingdom of God, of the world. In verse 8, the devil took Jesus to a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms and promised to give it to Jesus. You know, when I looked at the map, there are not many mountains in Israel. The closest one was in the region between Lebanon and Syria. It's called Mount Hermon. It's about 9,200 feet so in perspective, it's like if you go to South Lake Tahoe, and if you like to ski, the highest pound is probably that Kirkwood Snow Resort. Any of you skiers know where that is. So it's, it's, it's about that high. So Satan takes Jesus to this high place and said, here, I'll give it all to you. It may be the kingdom of Palestine or nearby area or it may be the kingdoms of the world. Satan was tempting to give the kingdoms of the world to Jesus. Satan tempted Je Jesus to save the world in an easier way. The real temptation here is to take shortcuts. Jesus would not have to go through this, the cross. He would not have to have the crown put on his head, the crown of thorns put on his head. He would not have to face the ridicule or the abuse of the Roman soldiers. He would not have to face a horrific death. But there was a catch, right? What was it? It was to worship Satan instead. Bow down and worship me. Jesus was smarter than that. He knew it all. All Satan could offer was this broken world, this warring world, where the Father has already promised to him of a heavy, heavenly kingdom that is to come, one that is filled with peace and God's righteousness. How did Jesus respond? In boldness, Jesus commanded Satan to go away because there's a greater kingdom coming, and that's my Father's kingdom. So what is God teaching us about temptation here, brothers and sisters? I, I came up with three things, so I'll share that with you. Since Jesus faced temptation, he is also preparing us that we will all face temptations as well. Doesn't matter. We will all face it. It will come to us in different ways. We are not immune to it. We may often feel that we're alone in our temptations like we're in the wilderness by ourselves. We may look around the path and see that nobody's looking or nobody cares. Even in our heads, we will say like, no, no one's ever been tempted like this. No one has ever to deal with this situation. The truth is that we will never escape it as long as we live in this world. So according to a CNN survey, it says that 60% of Americans admitted that they're tempted to worry too much 
or procrastinate. 55% say that they're tempted to overeat. 41% said that they're tempted to sloth or become very lazy. I was shocked to see this, but it says the sex, the drugs, the rock and roll lifestyles, they're below. 11% Americans said that they were tempted to use drugs. 9% were tempted by sexual inappropriate contact. When I look at this survey, I have fallen all into these temptations. But I thank God every day that he has helped me overcome most of them. My biggest temptation is to worry, just like what's on this list here. You know, growing up, I had this perception that we were very poor uh, compared to my friends. Uh, we came from Vietnam, and we, there were 11 of us, and we lived in a three-bedroom small home in Daly City. You know, compared to my friends, they had their own room, they got their own things, but when I look around, I had to share my room with four other brothers, and it's a tiny, tiny room with two bunk beds. We were on welfare, so every time we go to the market, we have to pull out that car, that money to use, I would be very ashamed. So this drove me to work so hard in school and even at work now. So that's okay if you're living by yourself, but when you get married, it's, it's a different story. Uh, and then when we have kids, it's just exacerbated. This caused a lot of tension in, in, in our marriage the early years. I would always push my little ones, uh, my children, to study hard. During the school year, I would push them to study hard even on the weekends. And if they didn't have any homework, I would make it them up myself. <laughs> and during the summer, man, that's a great opportunity. You're not doing anything? Let's pull out the books for next year and study that. But the crazy thing is that they're only in first and second grade, brothers and sisters. <laughs> so looking back, this was crazy. It got to the point where they would be scared that uh, if I was at home, <laughs> you know? Because they knew that if they didn't have homework, daddy's gonna give them homework. And if we're sitting there, sitting, eating dinner, after one or two questions, like, hey, how was your day? How was this? Oh, what's three plus three? Or what is this? <laughs> you know, it wasn't until this year that I finally had a breakthrough. I took two weeks off during Christmas and New Year, and I, and I think, again, that was all God's design. That my kids actually said, I really enjoyed having you home, Dad. You didn't test us. You played with us. So I can testify that uh, the, there has been a lot of joy in this area of, uh, of our marriage and our family life. God has changed my heart. I went from doubting God to take care of them to say, God, you know it best. You can take care of them better than I can. You know, I can see this for our young ones. We worry about getting good grades, what college to apply to, how many likes we have on Instagram or Facebook who our friends are on that. For a young and single, you worry about where to live, what career to choose, who will I marry. For young parents, we worry about if we're raising our kids properly or providing for them. For mature parents, it's what to do. How are our grown children doing? Will I have enough for retirement? Who will take care of me when I'm sick? Brothers and sisters, the root of all of our worries is that because we doubt God. Second, temptation is not a sin. Temptation, again, like I said before, was a solicitation to sin. It's an invitation, it's a doorway, it's a gateway to sin. Temptation always has an attraction to it, and it's very hard to withdraw from it. In my practice, I have this little boy who came to me, and he's only six years old. I won't name him. He came in. He says, Dr. Vu, you've got to help me. I said, why? i got a cavity. And I said, what happened? And this is his expression. I love candy, Dr. Vu. 
No, he said this. I said, what? I love candy. And he was shivering. Uh, he was shivering. And then this is the catch part. He says, but I can't help it, Dr. Vu. But I can't help it. So I told him, I said, you know, it's not the candy that's causing it. It's just you're eating too much of it. So I told him, I'll, I'll, I'll fix your cavity, but it's OK to have it once in a while. But it's not to indulge in it, not to eat it all the time. This story is a little simple, but there's some temptations that we just can't help ourselves. There's some drawn and attraction to it. And that's why we need Jesus to help us. I still love that boy. <laughs> I see him every few times here and there because they go to the same school as the children before. Again, the point is that temptation is often when we're at our weakest. Again, temptation is not a sin. But there's a beauty in this temptation and test. There's always a way out. Temptation always offer a way for us to escape, to obey God. Every temptation, we have two choices. Choose the one that bring God's glory. That's the way out. In 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able but with the temptation will always make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. You have a choice. We have a choice. That's why it's called free will. Jesus chose the way to glorify God. Abraham chose the way to glorify God. Eve did not. Same thing as J Judas. Was, as I was studying the scripture, I said, why God, why God would you bring your son to a place to be tempted by the devil? Why? Because these temptations have eternal consequences, right? You know, as a father of two children, I would not have the heart nor the strength to put my kids through any temptation. That's just a natural thing to do. In fact, I would lay down my life for them if certain temptations come that would harm them that much. I would do everything to protect them. But yet God did just that to Jesus, his beloved son. You see, God is teaching us the most important truth of all today. God did the most loving thing. God was preparing Jesus to fulfill, to accomplish his mission here to save the world through the cross. He was there with Jesus the whole time. And God showed Jesus not what, but who is going to be your greatest stumbling block, and that's Satan himself. Through these temptations, we see how loving our Father is by showing Jesus that he can withstand these temptations and ultimately the cross. And brothers and sisters, that is the essence of the good news. So, so what can we learn from Jesus and how we can apply it to our lives today? The key verse is in the second sentence of verse 10. For Jesus said this, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Brothers and sisters, Satan's ultimate game plan with all of these temptations is to stop Jesus from worshiping God. Jesus exposes all of Satan's schemes for us to be aware of today. He will use deception if, if, if to doubt us. He twists the truth around a little bit, just a little bit. But you know what? That separates really from life or death, just that little bit. Satan is relentless. He came back three different times on three different occasions to tempt Jesus. 
He can come us to us in many ways today. The moment we wake up, get out of, and go about our daily task and until we fall asleep. He can come through us through our flesh, through our eyes, or through our pride. Satan will wait for us when we're most vulnerable. Jesus was weak and hungry for 40 days of fasting. Remember when, when you were very most tired or sick or too busy or just had a bad day. So Jesus is teaching us to always be on guard, to know when the temptations will come. Jesus is reminding us today that we are made to worship God. The psalmist in 96, 7 to 9 says this, Give to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Give to the Lord glory and strength. Give to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. O worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Tremble before him, all the earth. We are made to glorify God and to worship him and him alone and only to serve him. That is the purpose of everything that we do, whether we're at home, at school, at work, or, retire, or if we're retired. We are to put God at the center of all that we do in our hearts, in our mind, in our soul, and our spirit. Sometimes, at some point in our lives, Satan will come along and tempt us from worshiping God to distract us to distract us from worshiping God, to wedge between God and us. So I can think of five ways that I want to share with you to apply today of how we can be on guard. The first is, everybody already knows, be like Jesus, right? Jesus overcame all of the temptations. He defeated all of Satan's schemes. That is the good news. And it's not just to imply that, God, that Jesus is giving us a model to resisting temptation, but truly that he himself is the answer for all of our temptations. When we accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, we are also adopted into God's family, filled with God's promises, filled with all of his authority to overcome lies and deceptions. God has also given us the Holy Spirit. Jesus promised us the Holy Spirit will help us. The Holy Spirit was with Jesus during all those three temptations. So we can have confidence in faith that the Holy Spirit will give us the wisdom to escape, to give us the strength to overcome. We have the Word of God. Jesus overcame all of his temptations not by his wit, not by his might, but the word of God. By quoting the scriptures, he rebukes Satan and all those lies. We should also be knowledgeable of God's word. You know, it may be hard at first. When my wife and I became follower of Jesus Christ, it took us about two or three years to read the Bible. In fact, my wife couldn't even read it. I had to read it to her for a whole year. But then after one, <laughs> I said, honey, you got to do this on your own now. You got to read the word yourself. And God has transformed us so much in that way. So as we read and spend more time, God will open your heart. He will give you fresh revelation. But we can't stop there. We have to live it out. We have to live it out. Jesus knew this. That's why he commanded Satan to go away. In other versions, it says that Jesus... Tell him to get out of here. Stop tempting me. And Satan had to obey because God's word is powerful. It's true. It's like a sword that will cut between any lies. Study God's word. It was awesome to see 12 brothers and sisters studying with Pastor Marcus for the last, what, five weeks now? That's one more to go. They're going to graduate. Two weeks. <laughs> you know? Lynn is opening up her home, not just for fellowship, but also an opportunity to study God's word. So I invite you, if you're free on Sunday, to go check her, uh, check her place out. Four, prayer. Pray to Jesus. He is sitting at the right hand of the Father right now. Jesus often prayed for God for guidance. 
He got up early in the morning. He prayed to God all the time. He was with God. And in our Lord's Prayer, in Matthew 6, 13, says, God, do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Ask God to lead you away from temptation. Ask God to show you the way, a way of escape. Spend time in prayer with God. God knows your heart. God knows your struggle. But it's in faith we can walk up to God and tell him. Pray with godly brothers and sisters here at New Vine. It could be one-on-one. -on -one. It could be with the group leaders. It could be with the pastors. It could be one of our elders. But just don't keep it to ourselves. Pray. Pray for family members. Pray for friends that you know that are in temptation. The final one is angels. God will send angels to take care of us. In verse 11 says, the devil left him and angels came and attended to him. Other version says, minister or serve. This is God's promise that he will